Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is screencast number 7 for Unit 4 VCA Physics topic Interactions of Matter and Light. Today we're looking at Photon Momentum. So we continue our journey into the dark side of light uh, looking at the particle model. Now in 1923 Arthur Compton named a beam of monochromatic x-rays at a small block of graphite. What he found was that the x-rays scattered at you know all angles but they had two different wavelengths. So some of them had the original wavelength and they were considered to have just hit atoms and bounced back. But others appeared to have longer wavelengths and this is something that the wave model doesn't account for. So what they found was that wavelengths of the scattered x-rays varied with the scattering angle. Now remember if it has a longer wavelength that means it's got a lower frequency therefore less energy. So some of these x-rays had lost energy to an electron that had been ejected from the graphite. So he came up with this theory considering that there were these elastic collisions occurring. If there's elastic collisions then momentum is conserved. So looking at the momentum equation we've got P equals MV but C being the speed of light is substituted in which can become E over C. Now this is using energy equals MC squared so we'd have to do MC squared divided by C and then substitute that in so we end up with E on C. Now E equals HF that's what we were looking at from Maxwell's theory so HF over C but lambda equals C over F. So rearranging again we've got H over lambda. So there's all these variations of the equation to calculate momentum. So particularly these two variations here may be useful for a two mark question that may pop up on your exam. So let's have a quick look at an example here. We've got a wavelength of 8.35 times 10 to the negative 10 meters for a photon we're asked to determine the momentum. So P equals H over lambda we've got H as 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 over the wavelength we've got 7.94 times 10 to the negative 25 newton seconds. Not a surprise that it's a tiny 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 amount of momentum. So based on these findings what else can we conclu uh, conclude about light other than it has a dual nature that it's behaving both as a wave and as a particle. Okay, There's experimental evidence that supports both these views but what I guess is perhaps most significant is that no experiment has ever shown it to behave as both at the same time. It always acts as one or the other. So to further complicate it we have uh, G.I. Taylor. He enters and performs the double slit experiment but he does it with such low intensity light that theoretically there can only ever be one photon in the chamber at any given time. So no interference can, can occur. Now this is something that would have taken weeks for the actual experiment to run due to the intensity. And so what he found after that is that there was still the same interference pattern on the film when he developed it. Okay, So it, it really sort of left you with the question you know, how, how do the photons know where they're going to go? You know, how does it know where to leave dark spaces and where it can and can't interfere? And really it, it's more like a probability distribution that the, the result um, and, and it sort of I guess shows where the photons are most likely to strike that paper. So what they then concluded is that an individual photon must have wave-like characteristics. So not only is it a particle, it's a particle with 
wave characteristics. So I don't know, that, that kind of just blows my mind, um, just getting way too complex. So we'll finish off with this uh, quote from um, William Bragg. It says, On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, light behaves like waves. On Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, like particles. And like nothing at all on Sundays. That about sums it up. See you next screencast.